Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of This is Revolution Podcast, the Tuesday edition. Uh, started the show off with a tribute to the late Michael Brooks. Today is the anniversary of his passing. Uh, I'm, like most of you, kind of in shock. It's been a year. Um, I was on a show that his sister, she's been on the show, but uh, his sister did something part of the Michael Brooks Project. Uh, a gentleman named Joe Payne and I were on a show talking about uh, Michael Brooks and his legacy. Uh, there is still a void in the in the left YouTube uh, podcast sphere that uh, I don't think will ever be filled. A mixture of intelligence and comedy who was very, his, his passion came through in everything he did. So you will be missed, Michael Brooks. Uh, and on that note, bringing in my homie, my dog, coming all the way from Miami, Florida. You may know him from all, I got to do the applause right now, from all the appearances he does on heavy of shows. Is he going to stay? Is he going to leave? It's like the LeBron decision right now with Pascal Robert. He is. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Is he going to go and go to stay? Going to go where? What are you talking about? Well, you know, the rumors are that uh, you might be filling the new black guy spot at the Majority Report. Take oh, note. man. First, what are you talking Dude, please. Uh, Another rumor is that you might be the new featured black guy on the Katie Halper show. First of all, how, if these are rumors, how come I'm not hearing any of them? Uh, because I started them. I started them, and uh, they're not real. But that's how rumors work. So in other words, you're creating a crisis in your own imagination that's not real. Yes. I and figured they, I beat, I'm beating the haters to the punch by causing a fake crisis that isn't real. Listen, uh, this is Revolution. is our show. I'm here. We are trying to uh, engage in serious discussions and not only provide entertaining left discourse, but serious conversations about it's expanding the political Overton window for uh, regular folk in our society. So I take that seriously. Someone is asking if Pascal has been on the Katie Halper show. No, he has not yet yet but katie halper and i are facebook friends good for you let's not talk about what that means <laughs> <laughs> shout out to janice graham in the chat is janice graham in the chat janice graham is in the chat she's very interested in this subject well this is a very interesting subject and it's interesting to, to me for a couple different reasons number one we don't learn this in school. It's only been 25, six years <laughs> since I left uh, California Public High School and never do I remember learning this in any of my California state history or any of my US history about residential schools. And it wasn't until my touring travels took me to Indian country and kind of finding my way immersed in a in a <clears throat> kind of native punk scene did i learn more about this history and how insidious it is or was and if we we talked earlier about it today with these redactions on education right like we're no longer going to teach critical race theory in school like they did in the first place we talked about it real quick off air wanting to uh what teaching the kkk wasn't bad you can't teach slavery was <laughs> it's you don't want to teach current events this is just the texas state but the several other states are, are trying to pass laws like this very important that we understand this history um so before we introduce our guests let us play the intro clip
There is a notion that poisons the minds of many Americans, the myth of manifest destiny, the narrative that the vast empty western lands of what we now call the United States was an untamed wild unknown filled with savages that could only be settled by a truly civilized people. In recent weeks, there has been breaking news from Canada that mass graves have been found near what were known as residential schools. These schools were boarding facilities with a long-standing partnership between religious institutions and national governments. Their goal was to isolate indigenous youth from their families, erase their customs and language, and assimilate them to the dominant culture. In the United States, Colonel Richard Henry Pratt was maybe the most impactful figure of the off-reservation schools. His goal was that of complete assimilation. His motto that became that of the system, kill the Indian, save the man. In this episode of This is Revolution, we'll take a deep dive into the insidious nature of the residential schools in the U.S. as well as Canada with historian John Graham. This is Revolution. I got frightened when I was a little girl when the when the principal used to beat up beat up the other children like boys. The boys got the most uh, beating. They used to call it bench party and it was usually done after supper and that's where I got frightened because I saw blood. I remember when we had to shower. Um, we, uh, you know, you only have to show me how to shower and clean and wash myself, how to wash my private and my, you know, private part of, parts of your body. You only have to show a kid once or twice at the most, but not every day. You know, and have uh, the supervisor come in there and and basically take advantage of you. Somewhere in these Chiricahua hills, no white man will ever know where, the Apaches buried Cochise, the greatest of their great chiefs. Geronimo faded into these hills and it took 5,000 U.S. soldiers to bring him out. And now Time Life Books brings the great chiefs to life again as your introductory volume to a fast writing series called The Old West. Hundreds of authentic pictures give you the real story. For the first time ever, you'll be able to see Geronimo's combat dagger and Colt 45. You look into the eyes of Sitting Bull, the man who destroyed Custer. Quana Parker, the fierce Comanche whose mother was a captured farm girl, and all the great chiefs. Eyewitness accounts and rare photographs and art bring the Old West to life. You'll meet the gunfighters. Men like John Wesley Hardin, so mean he once shot a man just for snoring. The cowboys, blazed in glory by the greatest artists of the Old West. The pioneers, battling the savage elements and bloodthirsty war parties. The gamblers, the women of the West. They're all here in big, handsome books with the look and feel of hand tool saddle leather. We'll send you the great chiefs for a 10-day examination. If you're not impressed, just return it within 10 days and pay nothing. If you decide to keep the great chiefs, you pay just $12.95 plus shipping and handling. Then approximately every other month, we'll send you another lively volume from the Old West Library for a 10-day examination. Keep only the volumes you want. You can cancel at any time. Here's how to order. Phone toll-free 800-228-3300. All right. Great chiefs. All right. Did that freak you out at the end, Pascal? It's all this part of this disturbing history of uh, this particular republic. Uh, in making that, <clears throat> I try to find pictures for a thumbnail, so I take a few pictures, and I was pretty much done once I got I found the Time Life commercial. There's a few that one actually worked, and uh, 
<clears throat> I found these pictures. I was like, I kind of want to keep this. And I figured something to do with the music to to bend the uh, the orchestral notes. And it just it scared the shit out of me looking at that picture. It really frightened the hell out of me. So without any further ado, he's a returning guest. I do want to let him know. I forgot to tell him this before we got on air. We have a moderator now. So this show is not going to get derailed as it did last time. With with John and Pascal yelling at the chat, <laughs> at the chat, coming all the way live from Springfield, Missouri, he is Doctor John Graham. I had this triple my lifetime applause. I think it's pretty exciting. <laughs> John Graham, yes, sir. I want to I want to start this off with this. Before we even get into residential schools, let's tackle the word, the phrase that you wrote a few essays about settler colonialism. We can't really explain residential schools without explaining that. We have you have about 30 minutes to explain all of Native American history before Perfect. The Mayflower. Go. All right. <laughs> so settler colonialism is a term uh, that was invented to distinguish between what happens in the U.S. Uh, and Canada and South Africa and Australia from more what we think of as traditional colonialism, like maybe, say, uh, Great Britain and India. Right. So when we think of colonization uh, or colonialism, we tend to think of um, a, sort of a temporary occupation. The point is to exploit uh, the local population for a certain period of time to extract natural resources. And you have a very small uh, colonial population, right? Mainly administrators, soldiers, things like that. Um, but with Southern colonialism, what you actually have is you have colonists moving in with the, with the goal of actually replacing the indigenous population and claiming that land as a new homeland. Um, right? So, so this is actually uh, what's happening in the U.S., especially in the Canada also, is we're going to come here. We're going to be the indigenous people. This is our home. Uh, and so we have to not only get rid of indigenous peoples, either either literally or at least destroy sort of distinct indigenous identity because we're going to take that on. But we also have to deal with these land claims, right? These are not empty lands. But there are lands now. We have to somehow destroy the ability of indigenous populations to claim those same lands, right? So that's where settler colonialism differs from other models is it has really two goals, right? Destroy indigenous societies, whether physically or, or in other ways, uh, and, and to destroy indigenous land claims. So is pretty much, is it fair to say that there is almost an innate genocidal capacity um, component to settler colonialism as a project? Yes, it absolutely, it, it, it must be genocidal to be successful, um, especially if we, we don't limit genocide to body count, right? They did genocide so much bigger than just a huge body count. It, if you look at the UN's definition, it basically means destroying the ability of a people group to continue to be that people group, whether kidnapping their children, uh, sterilizing them, right? It doesn't just mean literally going out with a gun and taking people out, which also happens right in the US and Canada as well. Yeah, so settler colonialism doesn't require the physical extermination of indigenous populations necessarily, but it is inherently genocidal. I'm perfectly comfortable saying that. You know, what's really fascinating about, and by the way, I really appreciate you highlighting the distinction between settler colonialism and the normative forms of colonial uh, extraction, not that they were kind in and of themselves, that happened particularly, particularly like in Spanish, uh, Latin America and South America. And the first time I think Jason remembers, the first time that I even became aware there were distinctions in these forms was reading Aviva Chomsky's book, who was a guest on our show. And mm -hmm. she really highlights that the, the, the methodology of uh, a colonial expansion in the United States differed greatly from what we had in Latin and South America, because in Latin and South America, the goal was actually to control the existing 
uh, native populations and extract labor or resources from them. But in comparison, when it came to North America and the United States and Canada and Australia, the actual goal was complete population re uh, replacement and extermination. Right. Exactly. So the question is, are, is the indigenous population a resource or are they just in the way? Right. And that's kind of the way of thinking of it. Yeah, this, that, this, this is a fascinating distinction. So, John, if you can really do us a favor, let's mm -hmm. talk about what the, the phenomenon that has put this discussion really kind of in the minds of everyone. And I know you're, you're a specialist in this in the residential schools in uh, in the American context. But can you talk to our audience in the chat about what exactly are the events in Canada, Canada around these particular institutions? Were they state institutions or church run institutions? The the the, the recent discovery of several uh, mass graves, or some people are debating whether they are mass graves or just simply unmarked graves. We can oh. talk about that debate as well. But put that con that the Canadian situation in proper context for our audience, if you can, please. Sure. So <clears throat> it's not that different on both sides of the border, honestly. Towards sort of the end of the of the nineteenth century, um, you, you have both nations sort of. Uh, entering what they would consider the final solution to the Indian problem, and I'm using that phrase ironically, uh, in the sense that, okay, so we're claiming the continent, it's clearly our land, uh, and science at the time is telling us that they either going to become civilized like us, or they're going to die out. Those are only two choices, right? And so we need to figure out a way to, to preserve them, to save them from themselves, but also make them useful to this new society that we're creating, right? There's, there's no sense of cohabitation. It's not going to be our land and their land. This is our land. If you're going to survive in it, you're going to be useful to, to our project. And so what happens, interestingly enough, is that Canadian officials actually travel to the United States. And at, at the time, the United States is was still relying on religious institutions to run its schools. It hadn't yet taken over them. The government hadn't taken them over yet. And they see this model and they say, you know, this could work. And so they start this this huge uh, this huge um, system of boarding schools across Canada. Uh, I think mainly in the West. Uh, and what you have is a partnership between church and state. So so the government is going to fund them, and the government is going to, in theory, sort of um, set the standards. Uh, determine what it looks like, but they're going to be run by by various churches. So it's a church-state uh, cooperation, and it lasts. Um, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure Canada doesn't take back over the schools at a government level until like the 1960s or 70s. So, so these religious-run schools last much longer than in the United States, where you have the same kinds of schools, but really by the 20th century, they're being run almost entirely by the federal government. Uh, and the purpose of these schools is, is to basically, I mean, they're genocidal. It is to destroy indigeneity, destroy the ability of these people to be Indian, to be or First Nation in the case of Canada, and, and to educate them, by which we mean forcibly assimilate them and make them useful to us, which really means basically preparing them for the menial labor market. Can you like, contextualize? Was a lot of their jobs was like kind of learning how to be a maid, learning how to sew, the men learning how to do kind of more manual labor. Right, right. It, it, it's really, really fascinating because um, on the one hand, you have the you have the boy students being trained for for more manual labor. <laughs> I mean, in some schools you might have some like an auto shop at some point, right? But but mainly manual labor. Uh, a lot of it is is farming or agricultural related. And then for the for the for the girl students, you actually are training them in domesticity. For both in the U.S. and Canadian system, the idea is that really the women, the the the, the future women are they are the key, right? Because when you have a civilized, if you will, a, a civilized um, indigenous population, you have to have civilized homes, right? Cold domesticity, Victorian values, all those kinds of things are at work here. So so you have the women being trained, the girls trained. How do you run a house? How do you properly clean a home like the civilized way how what kind of meals do you prepare in a civilized home how do you support your husband right um so so that's all a, a whole other level here right is you're really imposing uh the predecessor of the cold war nuclear family <laughs> onto these communal uh, societies and the way that you're forcibly assimilating their children Go ahead, Pascal. Can you me. contextualize the exact time period in which these institutions begin 
in both mm-hmm. Canada and the United States and how long they ex- actually extend into in their exi- existence? Sure, absolutely. So so in, in both places, right, uh, assimilation through education extends all the way back to colonial times. I mean, uh, on, on the on the U.S. side, right, if you look at the, um, the state at the seal for the for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it actually has a picture of a Native American saying, come over and help us. Right. Referring to the to the Bible story where Paul and the Macedonians say, come help us. So now do the, do the pilgrims and the Puritans really engage in it? Not that much, but that's at least that's at least one of the official reasons for coming, right? So all the way in colonial times, you have this sense of burden that these indigenous peoples, these backwards and civilized people, they need us. Um, that's going to continue in both countries. Um, a, mil- a really important date on the U.S. side is 1819. This is when the federal government actually establishes the uh, Civilization Fund, by which they start funding religious schools with, with federal money to do this forcible assimilation through education. Um, the Canadian side, I don't know as well at that time period, but but something similar is happening over there as well. And so when we get to talk about these boarding schools, these residential schools uh, in, the, in Canada and these boarding schools in the U.S., we're talking about really the last few decades of the 19th century. Uh, on the Canadian side, the I think the last of these schools closes in like 1980-something. I mean, they, it's a long-ass project. I think 96 um, is the last one closes in Canada. 96, Okay. Um, on the U.S. side, the, the, the particular assimilative model that, that the schools start with starts to get challenged in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. And just the practical economic realities of the war effort, the Great Depression, ends up closing a lot of these schools. So that the schools that survive, those, those cuts are still assimilative in nature, but they look a little bit different. Um, I mean, there's just there's a lot there to, to unpack. But basically, the U.S. boarding schools... The one, you know, there's still government-run schools today, um, and that's kind of a cool part of the story. Uh, some of those former boarding schools are actually controlled by tribal nations now, mm-hmm. who have taken over those schools. That actually, we're going to use these schools, these genocidal institutions, to actually preserve our culture and train our children. It's kind of awesome. To flip, flip, pretty much flip it on its head. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about the Panthers, especially even on this show. We don't really talk about AIM too much. The American. Mm-hmm. Uh, Indian movement. Um, what was their stance on these boarding schools? Uh, well, AIM, <clears throat> AIM is really, really important in trying to um, to found things called survivor schools or survival schools hmm. and find other sorts of educational outlets for reconnecting Native American youth to their, to their culture and, and to their heritage. A lot of the a lot of the folks that start AIM are <clears throat> in some ways detribalized functionally by the experiences with the boarding schools, but also because of some government programs in the mid 20th century where they're actually trying to destroy any sort of distinctive relationship with Native American tribes. And so a lot of their story is, hey, we're actually going to go and, and learn the ceremonies and try to relearn the language. And we're going to recapture those things to to help our to help our students uh, or help our children. Um, to, to recapture who we are. So yeah, so education uh, is very much at the very heart uh, of what AIM uh, is trying to accomplish. And they're doing that very much in response to a lot of the just shitty legacy of these boarding schools. John, can you explain for us the more detailed nu- nuances of the day-to-day operations of these schools and what mm-hmm. made them particularly damaging both physically, culturally, psychologically to these First Nations children. Sure. So let's so to get at this, let's um, let's just look at the very first day of school. Okay. When you arrive at a boarding school, you're probably gonna lose four things. Um, you're gonna lose your name. You're gonna be given uh, an English name of some kind. It 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 might be something simple like John Brown or it might be actually a name very full of meaning. Like if you look at the boarding school records on the U.S. side, you find Indian students named Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> uh, you find one named William T. Sherman. You find one named Julius Caesar. You're like, what the hell is going on, right? Well, what's happening is is they're, they're stripping those names and giving them names that are meaningful in this new society in which they're supposed to be integrated, right? And, and obviously, you know, in, in a name is 
is the hopes and and the dreams of uh, of your parents for you often right i i was named after um after my grandfather and my great grandfather because my parents wanted me to be men or be a man of that kind of character right so so the names that you're sending these students to school with aren't just random names they have meaning that's being erased so you lose your name you're gonna lose your language uh, you're not allowed to speak anything but english uh, at these schools um enforcement of that could differ from school to school if they if you were caught speaking your tribal language at some schools you might um have dinner taken away from you you might be put in the school prison overnight uh one canadian survivor actually records that a sewing needle was shoved through his tongue to remind Ooh. him to only speak english so it's, i mean it's pretty awful stuff so you lost your name your language you lose um you lose your um your physical appearance right? Your, your hair is going to be cut uh, if it's long, uh, which is a, a very, very important, significant cultural um, value for, for many of these tribal nations. So it's not a, it's not a small thing. And then you're going to lose um, your clothing, right? What they don't show you, what they didn't show in the Carlisle uh, clip that, that Jason used, um, they, came, well, they come to the school in, in, in clothes from home, right? In, in probably their very nicest clothes, their parents dress them as well they can. Uh, and then those clothes are immediately taken off and either thrown away or packed away. And they're given these school uniforms, which are basically military uh, uniforms. I mean, these are, for a long while, in the U.S. at least, these are functionally military schools. Um, so, so that's your first day. Your first day, you've lost four cultural, mar cultural markers, uh, intentionally erased from you. Uh, a typical school day, you're going to wake up early, usually with bugles. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a military school, again, on the U.S. side. You're going to go to, to you're going to go to classroom studies, um, which would be you know reading, writing, arithmetic, um, history. But of course, history taught a certain way, right? Let's learn about how your people are savages and how we're saving you. And by the way, you can say thank you anytime you want to. Uh, the other part of the day is going to be industrial training, making you useful in some way. Uh, and because of resource shortages at the school, a large part of your day is actually providing labor for the schools. You're actually just prison labor, quite frankly, uh, for these schools. Um, corporal punishment is very, very common, which most tribal nations don't don't use traditionally. And so you could be you could be um, you know spank things things that would not have seemed harsh to the white culture at the time, but also just really horrible physical abuse. I mean, I've, I've read the diaries of superintendents where the guy is bragging, okay, bragging about how he ended up breaking two buggy whips from just whipping the shit out of these runaway students. And he's proud of it. He's like, hot damn, not going to do that again. I've read letters where the superintendents have to explain why they spent money on handcuffs. Well, it's because this kid, you know, we had to handcuff him for his own good. Uh, you might be made to to dress in girls' clothes if you're a boy and walk around in a dress, right? Because, again, the, these gender expectations for boys and girls are very much a part of these schools. Um, sexual abuse, right, is a huge problem, especially the Canadian schools, but at the U.S. schools as well. Of course, part of the problem here, right, is that we survivors have to be willing to share those stories. So our sense of the abuse, um, sexual and physical, is probably way under what actually happened, uh, especially because the ones that suffered the most didn't live to tell us the stories. And, um, and you also see it in Canada probably more so than it here in the States. Um, I feel I feel like the maybe the population is just larger of First Nations in, in Canada, but there's definitely horror stories of a lot of women that suffered crazy sexual abuse uh, at the uh, yeah. boarding schools. Yep. Of course, later uh, fell, uh, fell into prostitution, especially in places like Vancouver. You definitely hear those stories about women that uh, were in the boarding schools and the, the, horror, the horror stories uh, that they tell of that. And also young men. There's a ton of young men that have horror mm -hmm. stories to tell. And even in that clip, uh, that that's from about a 30, 45 minute Canadian documentary about yeah. the residential schools. And it just there's actually three people that it documents that tell their stories of it. And uh, just that little clip was was very hard. to. <laughs> yeah. And, and to this day, the demographic most likely uh to be sexually assaulted most likely to be sexually trafficked is indigenous women in both countries and still. that is part of the legacy of these schools still 
One of the questions I actually would wanted to ask you, John, is that what was the vehicle or mechanism that w- basically got the children from their parents? How did they mm-hmm. either physically take the kids <laughs> or convince the parents to give them give the children to these schools? How <coughs> were the, what were the mechanisms that allowed the children to be uh, conveyed to these institutions? Sure. So, so part of it's just brute force. I mean, it's just show up, kidnap, right? That happens quite a bit. Um, on the U.S. side, at least, another big mechanism is is treaties. <clears throat> so you, you you make these treaties with these tribes. You force them on these reservations. These reservations are largely shit land, uh, and what you do is you withhold what you are supposed to give them by treaty until they send their kids, right? You know, we'd love to give you the corn. We'd love to give you this and this, but uh, until we see a certain number of kids, you know, we can't we can't give you anything, right? So you actually you actually um, <clears throat> hold their kids hostage, right? For 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 treaty um, obligations, so that's a big part of it too. Some you know some parents do send their kids voluntarily, right? Especially some leaders, because there is this sense of look, this isn't going away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to send uh, some of our youth to learn how their legal system works, how their language works, what their culture is. But certainly, um, in sending them, they're they're not they're not making a calculated risk like eh, this is worth a little bit of sexual abuse. They don't know those kind of things are happening, right? And when they find that out, they make every effort to get their kids back uh, with fairly limited success, right? Because I mean, the governments hold all the power. They they have the legitimate monopoly on force. They um, have all the resources they can withhold. I mean, it's just, there's not a lot of ways to keep your kid out of the system. This this is incredible. So mm-hmm. they, they were various, between the treaties and the actual forced takings were the mechanisms they use to take, take the schools, take the children to okay. these schools. Yeah. So in terms of the situation in Canada, mm-hmm. what do you attribute the factors to these graves and why is there a debate over what they're called was this something uh likable to maybe uh malnutrition uh neglect or was it just straight homicide what exactly do you attribute to these deaths happening or was it just kind of death by cultural trauma i mean you know a variety of things Sure. So, I mean, there are, I mean, there are sociopaths at some of these schools, just be honest, right? But for, for the most part, the major problem in both systems is that they're woefully underfunded. Um, they, they do not have enough food. They do not have enough supplies, period. And, and to add to this problem is, is the only way to get more money is to have more students in the schools, right? So now you've got overcrowding. Now you've got sanitation issues. So these, these places are just disease cesspools. So you have you have psychologically traumatized, kidnapped children who aren't being fed enough, who aren't sleeping and eating and cleaning themselves in sanitary environments, and it's it's no it's no surprise you end up with these with these graves, right? Um, I mean, do some of the graves represent kids just straight up killed uh, by by too much corporal punishment, things like that? Sure, I'm sure it happened, absolutely, but but the the number of bodies um, should horrify us. But given the way these institutions are run, the body counts are not surprising. These are places where you expect people to die, right? You don't have to intentionally take their life. The environment itself is just not a place where young kids are going to be healthy. So the, the next question I want to I have is that what kind of reaction were, were – the native the first nation tribes was there ever any kind of uh contemporary when these schools were were functioning Mm -hmm. rebellion against these systems were there attempts to get this you know get the kids back were there Mm -hmm. attempts to to you know for people to understand what was going on what you know what was that what exactly was the reaction amongst the uh the tribes i want to say tribes amongst the first nations people to the treatment of their children Sure. I mean, on both sides of the border, there's there's definitely attempts to um, to fight this system. There's attempts to use the courts at times, but uh, you know, in both um, in both countries, the legal system sees uh, indigenous peoples as not being citizens, as not really having any rights. You can't really use the legal system. You can try to straight up uh, rebel or resist, which does happen at times. 
but by the time these schools are taking place, the the military power of tribal nations on both sides of the border is, pre is pretty well broken, right? I mean, Carlisle opens in 1879. Um, <clears throat> Geronimo is captured uh, finally in the uh, in the 1880s, and in 1890 you have the Wounded Knee Massacre, which is kind of the end of the Indian Wars. Uh, in Canada, I don't know the timeline as well, to be totally honest, but it's the same situation, right? There is no, there's no effective way to mount uh, consistent violent resistance um, in any sort of successful manner at this point. Based on the timing of the creation of these institutions, mm -hmm. is it safe to say that one of the motivations behind them was to curtail the rebellious nature of the Native Americans or their, their, the, the threat that they pose to the uh, settler colonial project? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, the, the, the Canadian system uh, is that they're actually writing letters to each other, literally saying we should use these kids as hostages, right? That very much is is, is part of it. Um, yeah, there absolutely is there. Uh, one of the commenters, uh, Evil Yoda, says all the lands were on his shit land. You're right, Evil Yoda. I apologize. I, uh, sh I spoke way too generally. Um, I should have uh, been very more careful in the way I said, so I apologize for that. You're right. But, but yeah. Um, very much that's part of it right it, it's the it's to is to keep these um these tribal nations in check it's also to provide a way to, to take the remaining land right because if you assimilate the children and you send them home the idea is you're going to create a um you're going to create a system of, of individual families rather than communal societies and these individual families might take up a little bit of land but they're not going to take up all the land claims of the tribal nations themselves I do want to ask you a little bit about, because again, we do have to kind of get into the weeds a little bit about some sure. of these histories to give a little bit of context. Um, the Dawes Act. Yes. Do you, can you can you explain that to us, to the audience just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So the Dawes Act, um, <clears throat> the Dawes Act is passed in, uh, in 1887. As a story, you think I'd be more confident with dates, but I'm pretty sure it's 1887. It's sponsored by by a, a senator named Henry Dawes, and, and basically, it's 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 just another prong, honestly, uh, of the same uh, attack, settler colonial attack as as the boarding schools. Right? There's this sense that Native American peoples they're they're disappearing, uh, that they, they can't survive on their own, and one of the reasons they can't survive is because they are culturally backwards. So this communal living isn't going to work. As you look at some of the documents, they're actually complaining that the tribal nations aren't selfish enough, right? They don't have ambition. Um, they, they can't, they, they don't have the right kinds of desires. And so the Dawes Act is to takes these reservations that have been promised and it breaks them up by giving every head of household uh, 160 acres. And so once every head of household is registered with 160 acres, then the rest of the reservation lands are sold off forcibly, not in negotiations with the tribe. Uh, and that money is supposed to go to education or other ways to help the tribes. Some of it does. A lot of it ends up in the hands of very corrupt people, as one might imagine. So the Dawes Act is really to destroy reservations, to free up land for white settlers, and to destroy um, indigenous communities by by creating a bunch of individual nuclear selfish bastards. I guess that's kind of the it's kind of and that isn't reversed until the 1930s. And how does the Bureau of American Indian, or is it the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Affairs uh, mm -hmm. play into all this? I mean, well, they're they're the government government arm uh, in charge of dealing with relations with Native Americans. So they're they're overseeing a lot of this. They oversee the schools. Uh, they oversee uh, registration of what's called the Dawes Rolls. Um, so if you're going to break up these reservations, you've got to go and see who's living there. Who, uh, who are the heads of family, who are citizens of these tribes. And so it's a very sloppy, terrible, not well done process. But the result is these Dawes rolls, um, which have their own tortured legacy because they are used for some tribal nations to determine citizenship today. And it's just kind of messy because a lot of people purpose, you know, purposely avoided being on the Dawes rolls because the government says we're going to put your name down on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know, maybe there are reasons not to now, cooperate. Um, yeah. A side note on that. There, there is a bit of an issue about people claiming native heritage to sure. get government funds. Yep. And we definitely see there's a, I'll have to find the article and, uh, 
uh, M. Toussaint, if you can find it. I know it's in the L.A. Times. It's an article. I think it came out a couple years ago talking about the majority of people that are getting the funds for these like um, there's like a, a fund for and it's I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars for Native Americans to do like construction for, for government contracts. Sure. And these un, non-recognized tribes that look like a bunch of white people. Sure. And how, so how does the Dawes play into that? These unrecognized tribes getting, being able to get government uh, funds. Yeah. So, um, boy, this is really, this is messy stuff. <laughs> Sorry. All right. No, no, it's, 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 it's great to talk about. Okay. So to get certain benefits from the federal government and they're not handouts, right? They're treaty obligations. Uh, you have to be federally recognized as a tribe. Um, some tribes are state recognized. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake in being federally recognized, right? You're treated as a politically sovereign unit within the federal system. You are you're given access to federal fundings for healthcare, for education, different things like that, and, and to contracts, uh, business contracts, things like that, that are set aside for native people. So what you have is kind of a messy situations. So on the one hand, you have you have uh, tribal groups uh, who seem to have a, a legitimate historical uh, a record, right? But the government, with its arbitrary definitions of Indian, won't won't recognize them. Um, at the same time, you definitely have individuals who are forming five hundred one Cs, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and calling themselves Native American nations, like yeah, my, you know, we're we're a band of the the Hoosawatsits. We've always been around, and you know, um, so yeah, so fraud's a, a real problem here. I mean, th this is a messy thing, right? Because when you talk about group identity, it's connected to political sovereignty, it's connected to economic resources, it's connected to cultural linguistic preservation, right? So, so who gets to say they are Native American? There's a, there's a hell of a lot at stake in that question. That's why I bring it up because it also, for me, uh, frames my kind of objection to the ADOS argument. For, there's other reasons, but I was always like, well, who gets to be black? And why don't mm -hmm. you talk to Native Americans about who gets to be Native and who gets these benefits? Right. You know, because I think w working in the, I guess we would call it the West, what would you call North Dakota? Uh, it's called. It's called the Midwest or the the, the frozen Midwest or something. <laughs> the, the tundra. Working in North Dakota, I'd, I'd never seen racism like that, so blatant, vocal. It's the West, I saw it too in certain parts of Arizona when mm -hmm. it came to, to indigenous people. And there is a... a a notion that they all get free money from the government right just for, just for being who they are and the reason why they're poor is because they're just shitty people that don't take advantage of their free magical government money and again <laughs> being, being being i don't want to get too much into why i was in this <laughs> environment with a bunch of uh native cats in, in the dakotas but hearing their firsthand accounts of how that shit just ain't real really blew my mind because people truly believe like, Oh, they get free money. They casino money. They all have a casino, right? Right. They all have oil and casinos, all of them. So yeah. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. Somebody in the comments asked several times now, if I was making fun of the Lumbee, no, nothing I said should be construed as that. If you don't know what that means, that's, that's totally fine. But just so that, uh, watcher isn't concerned. No, I'm not mocking the Lumbee at all. The interesting thing about these perceptions that you were talking about, Jason, is that all you have to do is peruse a, a casual demographic data on quality of life statistics of Native Americans vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, alcohol abuse, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, mass incarceration, vis-a-vis -vis crime, vis-a-vis -vis all of that stuff, domestic violence. And they're probably one of the few communities that have worse numbers than uh, black Americans in in in, in many contexts. It blew me away because I didn't know. I'm I'm I'll be honest, and I'm probably gonna sound stupid, and people will make uh, Jason so dumb comments. I don't care. I didn't fucking grow up around a goddamn reservation, so what the fuck am I really supposed to know about what reservation life is supposed to be until I get to one? God damn it! But um, I remember being on a Greyhound bus because I don't like flying. Taking a Greyhound bus from Oakland, California to 
Williston, North Dakota, and it's not a straight shot. And somewhere around Bismarck, we had a stop on the bus and I got out, we got to get out to like a little convenience store to get snacks and a black woman had walked out and she was the first black woman I saw in two days. I stopped her, asked what she was doing there. She says she worked there and she was talking to me and I was like, are white people cool here? She goes, oh yeah, for the most part, man, you have nothing to worry about. She goes, they hate natives more than us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, cool. pretty incredible. It, it, it was. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. So, John, one of the questions I want to ask you relative to this as well is that um, in a lot of this particular history being exposed in the mm -hmm. contemporary moment, how do you think as a historian, does this complicate the current battle that we're seeing with states that are fighting against mm -hmm the historical narratives of America as a nation that aren't particularly rooted in <clears throat> romantic examples of American exceptionalism and pie in the sky, the great frontier. In other words, the, the fact that conservatives in various states like Texas, as Jason mentioned earlier, are trying to strip any type of narrative that discusses the tortured racial, social, and settler colonial history of America from academic institutions. How exactly do we jive these, this new development with that particular movement? How was the discourse being rendered in academic circles? How do you see this playing out? Jason, if you want to add any comments? No, no, no. I'm going to shut up and listen. Yeah, I, mean, I think one thing it, it does is it reminds us, right, that the, America's history is not just black and white, um, and that's that's sort of the that's sort of the focus uh, for a lot of excuse the pun, right? That's an excuse the pun, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Excuse the pun. If whatever makes you sound smarter, that's what I meant. So we'll go with that. <laughs> um, but I, I think it, I think it challenges a lot of the same myths um, that 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 the current hysteria right over everything that is race the CRT apparently uh, is stirring up in people. Look, you, I tell my students sometimes I'm like, look, you live in a country that's an extraordinary experiment and freedom and Liberty. And it's built on the backs of, of slave labor and the genocide of native Americans. You have to deal with that. You have to deal with that reality that this was an experiment that was not meant for everyone at the beginning. It sure as hell was not. And it was an experiment that was justified by by making others less than human right i mean we hell even in the 1776 commission they literally talk about one of the things that should unify us is that together we conquered or tamed an un an, of the wilderness right i mean that's that's phenomenal it's like look let's focus on things we have in common like the fact that we tamed the wilderness well no what you did is you invaded people's homes took their stuff forcibly assimilate their children, sterilize the women up through the 1970s, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal that we're given this all or nothing history. Right? You either must acknowledge the United States is, is, is amazing and glorious and exceptional and freedom, freedom, blah, 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 white people rate slaves, and it's not really important, or you want to destroy the nation, right? Those are your two choices, apparently. Um, and and it's, just, it's extraordinary. And, and I, what I hope is that these, especially as, as Secretary Holland's initiative on the schools, opens up, opens, up, opens up another front on this, right? Like, all right, you want to talk about slavery for a second? That's fine. Let's talk about genocide, right? So that, that, that's my hope, um, he says in his grumpy old man rant. So, Well, well the question for me particularly is that with this politicization of history, Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, as a historian, I ask you this sincerely, sincerely, uh, is the project of the nation state so built in mythology mm -hmm. that the capacity for true rendition of history becomes impossible? I mean, yeah, I, I would I would say yes. Right. So so uh, Ben Anderson got into a lot of this in his imagined communities. Right. But but the. 
the nation state wants to see itself as both being a natural organization for humanity, and it's not, but also as being sort of an inevitable, right? The progress of history led to the nation state. That's the way we tell our own story, right? This happened, this happened, and it was all leading to the United States. Other countries do the same thing, right? It was all leading to France. It was all leading to Great Britain. So we see the nation state as sort of the end of history, right? To use the title of a uh, somewhat um, interesting book, right? Mm -hmm. The end of history. And so I don't think it works because the nation state is not, it's not natural. We're, as human beings, we're not wired to swear allegiance uh, uh, to nation state contracts, I don't think. It doesn't mean it can't be used for positive stuff i guess but it's just hard to keep it tenable i mean i mean my 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 beef and i don't know if you feel the same way pascal those like time life books the re reason why it was like on my mind is because i remember touring through places like montana and i like sh thrift shops and you go to these small town usa you can find cool shit at little thrift shops right for a couple bucks and one thing that I found kind of constant when I went through certain parts of the country was that Time Life book set was always at a thrift shop. <laughs> wow. With those paintings. What's who's the guy? Maybe someone in the chat knows if no one on the show knows who's the guy that made those kind of great big paintings of like the manifest destiny paintings of like some majestic fucking cowboy slaughtering. Again. About Remington? Is that who yes. you mean? Yes. That's some bitch. Like Remington shit everywhere or Remington esque shit everywhere. The it Thomas Kincaid of the of the American exceptionalism, basically, yes. <laughs> okay, by the way, this is I'm glad you mentioned that. Can you explain for our audience, by the way, that the concept of American exceptionalism is really like a post-World War II kind of reality? That it's not something that kind of originates, you know. Sua sponte out of the birth of the nation. What, what, what are the origins of the concept and when it really becomes popularized? Do you, you, do you feel confident in discussing that? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, um, so from the beginning, the United States wants to see itself as different than Europe, right? There's this sort of kid brother syndrome. Um, and, and, and one of the ways they want to distinguish themselves is that they're not going to expand through to tyranny and conquest. They're going to have what Jefferson calls an empire of liberty. And he doesn't mean that ironically. He really means an empire, and he really means based on liberty. How that works, I mean, you can ask him, right? Uh, so from the beginning, you have this sense of uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be like the other guys. Uh, we're not going to do this in the same way. Um, and so I think that idea, I think, it's, I think it grows over time. Um, and it can really be found in like Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy. Um, it can certainly be found. And if you look at World War One, right? Why does Wilson say we're going to war to make the world safe for democracy? There's a sense of the U.S. has a moral responsibility as a defender and promoter of democracy. Um, so even before like the phrase is uh, is created, you definitely have this sense of the United States as a unique nation with a unique um, history that gives it political but also moral superiority which uh, gives it certain obligations uh, on the world stage, right? I mean, hell, even when Obama was talking about maybe possibly there being some sort of red line in Syria, he uses the language of American exceptionalism to explain why the U.S. might get involved in Syria. 2016 campaign, uh, Trump and Clinton both use that kind of language. So it's still the foundation, I, I think, of U.S. self-perception, um, not only of its own history, but also... Uh, it, its role in the world. Do you think that that narrative is fundamentally tied into the pretext America uses to act as an empire in its projects all over the globe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely, right. I mean, the the, the project, the, right, the nation building in Iraq, for example, that is an American exceptionalism model. We promote democracy, which everyone should want. And by the way, where there's democracy, there's automatically a free market, which is great for us because now you'll buy all our shit, which is great. We have to export to keep the system alive, right? But yeah, th there really is this sense of America being unique, morally and politically unique. It is superior to other countries. I mean, you hear this from the conservative media all the time. You list all these national sins, all these problems. They'll be like, yeah, 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 point conceded, but this is still the greatest nation of all time. And if you don't say that back, we don't say, 
yeah, maybe for some people, or it's got some things going for it, then you are not a patriot. The the running joke in a Chris Rock movie from I want to say it was the late nineties, head of state, where he's the uh guy running for president, is uh they always have to say, God bless America and nowhere else. <laughs> remember that movie, Pascal? I do remember that movie. Well, you know, I find I find I've always found that this kind of uh blind patriotic narrative, you know, uh that is replete not exclusively in the United States, but in the nation state project, sure. fundamentally premised on mendacity, lies, and ignorance. And I think that, you know, part of patriotism when you're dealing with an empire like the United States is premised on moral cajoling of people into believing things that are fundamentally untrue. Because when sure. you're exposed to the truth of the nation, then you have to really start to wrestle with the fact that how exactly are you going to make the 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 plea that this place is morally super, superior? Right. Yeah. I mean that that's that, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> no one wants to say. Uh, no one wants to say might makes right is the reason we exist. Right. We want to say wow. there was some there was some divine destiny or there was some moral superiority. That that is, is why we exist, and other empires don't, or why we defeat other people. Uh, and so, yeah. So every every empire and every nation state is going to have, um, it's going to have this founding mythology that it has to have to to justify on on ethical grounds why this project ought to exist and why it ought to continue. Someone's asking, can you lay out the difference between a nation and a state? It's an interesting question. Sure. Um, so the way that like political scientists usually use the term is that a nation refers to an to an ethnic group, right? Uh, whereas a state refers to the the political uh, organization, uh, <clears throat> like the country that that nation that that nation forms. So nation state is a combination of an ethnic nation with its own uh, political structures. Uh, I mean that's the way that. The political scientists tend to use the terms. I'm probably going to get an angry email from my colleagues at MSU who are listening, but but that's the gist of of the distinction there. Um, so functionally, the way we talk in everyday life, there's not really a distinction we're trying to make very much. But that's technically the difference. Thank you for the super chat, Jeremy. Shout out to Jeremy for helping us with movie night. We, that was a quick hour, man. I think I decided what movie I want to do for movie night. I Shaq? We, close. I'm thinking we do Black Widow. It's just White Shaft. And uh, <laughs> we'll cover that. So Because it's like $30 to watch. Like We'll do it so people can watch it for free. And then we'll deconstruct if it really is uh, anti-Soviet Union propaganda. What do you say? I'm flexible. And yes, I said it. Black Widow is white shaft. Go ahead. You heard it here first. You heard it first. Well, John, one, we, one thing we, we didn't ask you yet is that are you able to do a you know a patrons only uh section session with us after our hour, which is basically over, where we can maybe for a half hour or so, or maybe a little longer. Sure, I'd be happy to stick around. That'd be fine. Jeremy says Black Widow is like two hours and ten minutes. It doesn't matter, Jeremy. First, first of all, I'm trying to bless everybody with a free thirty dollar movie. That's the only way I can stick it to the man is by showing people a thirty as many motherfuckers as possible a thirty dollar movie. Sounds like ingratitude to me from your from your patrons. That's that's unfortunate. And. uh Janice Graham had a question that we should ask in the second hour. I, it scrolled down the screen. Janice, re-ask your question in the uh, Patreon section so we can address it. So it's going to take me a little... Give me a couple minutes, guys, to get the link up. Uh, Restream is being... They're having some te technical difficulties right now with the ability for me to create these links a little quicker. So give me about five to seven minutes and I will have a new link. Professor Graham, thank you so much for, for agreeing to come back on. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Whenever conversations go fast, to me, that's usually an indication that it was a good show. And this hour flew by. 
it, 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 I'm shocked. It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Or nine o'clock where I am. <laughs> well, you know, also too, again, from the first time you were on professor Graham, a lot of things have changed about the show. One new <laughs> thing is there is a moderator. That's not just a moderator, but moderates all the big shows in this lefty YouTube sphere. And is kind of amazing at it and really controls the vibe of this chat on a whole nother level. So always utmost fucking props. Shout out. For the, for the super chat, we, we did mention Michael Brooks in the beginning of the show. There you go. Shots fired because our, our moderator is so dope. <laughs> uh, yes, we did. Oh, okay. Pascal, yeah, we did talk about uh, Michael Brooks in the beginning of the show. And on that note, we are out.